Title IX, 50 Years On, is our program in a series that we've been doing this week and have had opportunities to talk to several people about Title IX and, and when it started and what we remember. And we have an opportunity again to meet with um, Tina Thomas and, and a chance to to look back at what was 50 years ago. So we'll kind of start there. Um, where where were you 50 years ago? And, and is there any record? You know, the more I talk to people about this, the recollection is, well, we didn't really know what it was or well, we, what. We didn't really know what Title IX was 50 years ago, except for I was pretty aware of something happening because I was a sophomore at Marietta High School. I was class president of um, the class then, and Ben Webb was the principal at the high school. And we'd always been in these discussions, casual, very courteous discussions about why don't we have women's sports or girls' sports in high school at Marietta. And June rolls around of 72 and Title IX's passed. And I was in conversation with Mr. Webb and he says, if you can get 10 girls to come to a meeting, I'll go to the school board with you. Wow. Okay. So all the, that was the standard, 10 girls. We had about 24 show up and he stood to his word and he and I went down to the school board and they started girls' sports that fall Wait, of my junior year. Was it a daunting thing at the time? I mean, did you feel like, oh, I, oh boy, here we go? No, we were playing GAA sports. We were playing softball recreationally. We were swimming for the Y. We were playing wherever we could. We had Girls Athletic Association is what you would do for activity. You would com kind of compete with each other doing those kinds of activities. But there was no competition with other schools. Right. So... So we got the, we had a meeting, girls came, we got the sport started. So we started with four sports. So we're now, we're two years into, what was Title IX? So it was... That would have been my junior, no, June of 72, it passed, that's between my sophomore and junior year. Okay. So we have this meeting, we start up, and now we're in fall of 72, and we are starting volleyball was late because was volleyball season was starting. So we we're going to do track. We we're going to do gymnastics. We we're going to do basketball. And we also had tennis. So I guess I did, this is the first I've really kind of hit on somebody talking to somebody who was right there when it happened. So do you think that the passage of Title IX in 72 is what prompted this? No question. Because okay. they wouldn't do it before then because oh. it required funding. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so we... We didn't have funding. We had barely had the funding for the men's sports. So we had had to find some funding in, remember, Title IX is an education bill. It wasn't an athletic bill. It's really part of education. What it was doing is saying you had to have equal opportunity for women in educational situations, sports being, athletics being one of those. So mm -hmm. we, I think um, Linda Eddy was one of the first coaches. Sure. Barb Pape was one of the first coaches up there, Barb um, Hartong, and so we were going to get some money. We got, they asked for a couple hundred dollars to get us started. <laughs> we got shorts for everybody, and then we had T-shirts with numbers on them, and we would hand the shirt to the player as they subbed in for you. Right. Okay. Oh, so, so basketball, track and field, gymnastics. I don't remember much about gymnastics, so I didn't do that. And then we had um, volleyball started up, didn't have – they practiced a little bit the first year. Didn't have any competitions. All right. Interesting. So I'll, I'll take you another kind of off that thought. And Tina Thomas is our guest. She is the assistant professor of petroleum engineering and land management at Merida College currently. And, and we're, we're back into the 70s right now. So if we go back there, I think about the statistic that I read that said in the 70s um, that one out of, geez, like 30 girls was playing sports and now it's like one out of two so so i know it's 50 years on but talk about having to fill a, a team so you've got everybody played every sport and everybody sure. was welcome to play i mean when i when i went to, i went to college and played basketball and i'm there to, to play basketball and the basketball coach is also coaching the field hockey team and said we don't have enough players come play field hockey with us Happened to fit into that first field hockey game I ever saw was when I was starting in at a varsity level. Yeah. Okay, at a school in Columbus. So at the time, we, the women and girls just wanted to play. Right. We didn't think about the regulations. We didn't think about 
we didn't have it before. We didn't have to have fancy uniforms. We just wanted to be able to play. We had to find some competition. And it, and it sounds like if you played one sport, then you probably wanted to play the other. You played the them other, all. Sure. Yeah. You played them all. I, so I mean, I got varsity letters in basketball, track and field, volleyball, uh, field hockey, whatever the sports are. You just played them all. I was playing softball already with Tony Azar's group. I was oh, sure. I was swimming with the Marlins. We were. I mean, you just did it. Whatever it is, you did because you loved the athletics, the competition, the team camaraderie, all those intangibles that go with sports as opposed to just competing. Then did it, so if you're in a season, um, do you recall the go from a spring to a fall to a winter? Um, just trying to think of the transitions of sports. Yeah, you take a, take a day off and start the next season because we were <laughs> yeah. overlapping, right? Right. Now, remember, at that time, none of the other schools had teams, so the big, big obstacles was who do you compete against right so we had something that was i was doing some research on this that is the the ohio river league or something okay. it was based in parkersburg we played at married high school we played parksburg catholic we played um williamstown fort fry meadowbrook warren um those were the kinds of teams that athens high school was in there that's who we would have competed with those first few years um volleyball they didn't have much competition the first year by the senior year. So senior year, we're two years into this now, right? And now we're getting pretty good. So you're a driving force uh, as a student, as right? A student. Because you said, let's go to the board meeting. And, and so who were then the driving forces that would have been maybe your mentors that made you feel like, we can do this, let's go? Ben Webb was the mentor. Yeah. He was the principal, and he's the one that said, yeah, and all of my classmates that wanted to do something. Right. So the the women just banded together and said, we're going to do this. And we did it. I mean, before we could cheerlead or we could um, play the girls' athletic sports. Right. And then, you know, two years into it, I'm getting ready to – I'm graduating in 74. That's two years of high school sports, and now we're going to college to go play co college sports. Yeah, that's a great transition into what I'd like to talk to you about next. We're going to take a break. Uh, we're talking to Tina Thomas. Our program and series brought to you by Merida College is, is called – uh, Title IX, 50 years on. Tina Thomas, our guest, will continue our conversation right after this. Johnny Worf, along with uh, Tina Thomas, and we're talking about the 50th anniversary of, of Title IX and just really compelling stories that you share with us about uh, 1972 to 1974, your high school years, and when uh, women's sports came into being um, at that level uh, competitively. And so talk about then a transition of moving to that next stage because a lot in most people even now that's it high school's over you're done right you might go play your intramural or you might go down on the softball field or whatever the case might be but were did you feel like there were opportunities then there were yeah. um i i was focused primarily on what i was going to do academically but i wanted to go to a school that's going to allow me to sure. also compete because sure. i I knew I loved competition, whichever level it was at. And um, I ended up going to Ohio Dominican up in Columbus for my freshman year, To and I was playing basketball. Ended up playing basketball and field hockey and tennis up there because the transition you're talking about, not enough people to fill out the teams. Not that I was a good tennis player, but I could play number six or whatever the last doubles plot mm -hmm. was to fill out the roster so they could have enough to compete. Field hockey I ended up being pretty good at, and I – Everybody was competing, and everybody was just loving the fact that they were there, not, oh, why didn't we have all of these fancy things that the men had? We were just enjoying the fact that we were having the opportunity to play. We'd go to tournaments, and um, I transferred from Ohio Dominican down to Marriott College my sophomore year. We, ended up, we were playing Ohio State. Oh, my goodness, yeah. We beat Ohio State in oh, field hockey. Okay, put that on the record. <laughs> yeah, jot, somebody, jot, somebody jot that down and take us back a little bit. So who was, um, so that would have been Phil Roach time? Phil or? Roach was here, yeah. Um, um, Ralph Lindemood was here. Uh, Lecl after, your coach, was it LeClaire? Or? Vi LeClaire was a phenomenal coach, and yeah. I had run into her at a tournament when I was playing for Ohio Dominican. I married at college, was that that same tournament i was talking to her telling her i was thinking about switching to marietta college for petroleum engineering hey when you're down here come talk to us because we could use you on the basketball team we could use you on the field hockey team. so i ended up um earning varsity letters in field hockey and varsity and basketball for marietta college played three seasons for each sport at marietta 
and it was just it makes your college career just like it makes your high school career or your little league career because you have these teammates that you've got this bond with you've got that uh, allegiance of lifetime friends sure. that you still see you still reach out and talk to on occasion or whatever it is that's related to athletics because it was fun competition and then, as, and so now we, we've gone from being a Panther at Ohio Dominic and into being a pioneer at Merida College and accolades that, that still come down. I, I see your picture down there on the wall, and that's a, yep. that's a big deal, man. I, I just uh, I can't imagine uh, the pride of, of that. But from a, from a fan standpoint, I showed, I showed Debbie Lazorik some photos of I uh, had down old Timlin Hall, and it was more... 50s intramural you know but there there was there there was that uh wanting i guess of, of to being a part of something but but actually being on the team wearing the uniform entirely different entirely different you still competed for your fraternity or sorority and all the greek activities you still competed with whatever your clubs were being on a college team having people in the stands and we actually had okay falling um not a lot but people were there. We had um, coaches. Violet Claire was a tremendous coach. We had some very good players on our team. In the years to come after us, you knew the program was building. I was there for the first softball team. We weren't at the varsity level yet, but we were there for the very first softball team that transitioned into the varsity season next year. We played in the on the field that's diagonal across from Don Drum. It's where cornfield is now, or the, right. the farm, sure. the, the vegetable farm is. Um, we practiced at a crazy times. You know, we didn't have court time because baseball had to have the main basketball court to practice indoor. So we had to practice on side courts as the varsity women's basketball team. But that didn't matter. We were still playing. Uh, and I wonder if the, if the people who were the mentors or the coaches realized how impactful it was. I was When I talked to Debbie about Viola Claire, I knew her very differently than most people because I knew her as as the mom of the wife, the baking the cookies, going over and doing newspaper. You know, I was on the newspaper mm-hmm. staff, and, and she would always just help us on a Saturday or Sunday was when we did all those things. And yet, man, when you think about the impact that she had, you know, in, in our world here globally, I guess, as you think about the sport. She was such a driving force without being a force. Yeah. She just came across as the nice old... That's Neighbor, ex- yeah. neighborly mom that's there to make cheesecakes for us whenever we won a game. Didn't have to make too many of those. But she would um, bring her kids to the games. But then she was in there fighting for us. Right. You know, she was in there telling Coach Linda Mood that, hey, we should have some practice time. And it shouldn't be 11 o'clock at night. All right. We should have fill in the blank. Sure. So she was doing the fighting for us behind the stages as the athletes. We didn't have to know that. Yeah. And she fought for us to get varsity jackets. And I don't know if Debbie mentioned that to you, but we got Carolina no, Blue no. windbreakers. No, that's crazy. Carolina Blue windbreakers for Marietta College. Wow. As our varsity jacket. We didn't know any better. Right, right. right. And if you were there long enough, you got your varsity M mm-hmm. sewn onto a blanket, not a jacket. Oh, wow. That's okay. great. Totally w- different. Wool blanket. A wool blanket. <laughs> a wool blanket. A wool blanket. But those things didn't matter. I mean, I still have contact with some of my teammates because we we were there. You bonded just like you would with any team. Yeah. And that makes the experience better. And now you look at the Marietta sports. They're phenomenal. Well, my goodness. I, I can't. Um, and I want to talk to Kathy Borich a little bit later. But um, uh, I think of my daughter, who's a sophomore, and just gets up and goes and and plays in a golf match and ends up, you know, at a, on an Ohio State course or something like that. Like it's not like that, it's nothing, right? It's just it's part, expected. It's expected to be that way. So um, as you look at and and you kind of started down that path when I jumped in on you, but 2022 women's sports, 50 years on, Title Nine has made a difference without a doubt. Um, but where do we go from here? I guess is. The and next. I don't know that. And I don't know that we need to go any place else right. different because female athletes today don't even think about title nine applying to athletics right, right. they think about title nine applying to all the other things that title nine goes with education wise sure discrimination or some other things that are related to title nine they don't even think about the fact that we didn't have sports when they were born so access just purely 
access is is where it all it, it is. just give us an opportunity yeah. and you're going to find the natural drive the natural competition the natural leaders come out and do it and kathy is a, a great example mm -hmm. 10 years prior to we didn't have sports and look at phenomenal athletes right years. right okay there's somebody that had some god-given talent inherently driven to be great in not that lifelong practicing because it wasn't there when she was born yeah, I said final thought. I always do that a lot, and then I have one more thought. But <laughs> Tina Thomas is our guest, and we appreciate her uh, giving us some thoughts. But I think of, as I was listening to you talk there, like the AAU part of the world we live in, and now all of a sudden you got opportunity on, on top of opportunity. But you're like, hoorah, not like, man, I didn't have that, right? Yeah, we could sit here and bellyache. What yeah. good's it going to do yet? Okay, right. so I had to go run stairs because we at the college because we couldn't get into the weight room. We didn't have a weight room. So we could run stairs or we could do yeah. push-ups or sit-ups or right. whatever. The one piece of equipment we had was a leaper machine that maybe you could jump and get some clearance off the ground. Right. <laughs> you didn't know any better. You had what okay. you had, right? You had what you had. You took what you had and go with it. And we turned out to be okay. Yeah. And look what has grown into and that's what, and I think that's what you look at is what do we see for the sports now, 50 years from now, where are they going to be? Right. How phenomenal are athletes going to be? Right. Does it take another regulation to make them better? Right, right. So great stuff and compelling information. And I would add to the listeners uh, right now that you said, what are we going to talk about? And I said, I have no idea, Tina. We're just going to talk. And that's what we did <laughs> for, what I, for what I told you was going to be 10 minutes and just turned into 20. But that's all right. I appreciate that. And it's, it's so much fun to do these uh, uh, shows. And we appreciate Meredith College for bringing it up and asking us about it. And we appreciate you coming up. My pleasure. All Thank right. You. Tina Thomas, our guest. The program uh, series is Title IX, 50 Years On.